Hello and welcome back everyone to the second day of the workshop, Advances in Multimodal Artificial Intelligence to Enhance Environmental and Biomedical Data Integration. As you all know, this workshop is sponsored by the National Institutes of Environmental Health Sciences. And we have had an amazing day there yesterday. It was very dynamic. And if you missed it, a quick reminder that everything is going to be online. All the recordings are going to be online in a week or so. So check back on uh, our website and you will see all the recordings. So you know what you will be watching for the next month. And uh, I, we, had, uh, we learned a lot. To be honest, the, the workshop yesterday was both informative and inspiring. We had a lot of great presentations. We learned all the possible biomedical applications. And clearly, we un my, my understanding has changed a lot of how ready this is for prime time. And, but without further ado, um, and also I, I want to remind everyone that uh, at 12.40 we will have a, a breakout groups and informal networking. Um, and to access that, there is a separate link. So you will, you will have to log out, log off at uh, 12.30 when we will finish the two sessions and uh, come back with a different link. Uh, which is for the breakout groups. The link is in the agenda, so you can find it there. But it's going to be sent out to your email uh, around 12.30, so you will have it also in your email, and it will be posted in the chat here. Uh, we had two sessions today that are amazing, one on perspective AI and data governance and infrastructure. And the second one, session five, will be on technologies and tools to advance environmental health and biomedical research. Uh, but without much uh, further ado, I would like to ask our next panelist to come up on the screen or on the room. We have a wonderful set of speakers, leaders from federal and state agencies and nonprofit organizations to speak broadly about AI and data. And with that, I'll turn it over to Gwen Artinger. Thank you so much. Good morning. Thank you everyone for being here. My name is Gwen Ottinger. I'm a professor at Drexel University in the Center for Science, Technology and Society and the Department of Politics. Uh, and I'm very pleased to introduce this panel. Um, our goals in this session are to take a high level look at the question of the, of the whole workshop, which is um, the opportunities for using artificial intelligence and machine learning to address environmental, biomedical, and public health questions. Um, so in this panel, we will be talking about um, the initiatives that different government agencies and organizations have to um, use AI, machine learning, and data. Um, the issues related to AI and data infrastructure um, at, at a 10,000 foot view um, and some governance issues related to AI, machine learning, and um, environmental and public health. So our first speaker for today is Dr. Susan Grigurek. Uh, she is the Associate Director for Data Science and the Director of the Office of Data Science Strategy at the National Institutes of Health. Um, the Office of Data Science Strategy leads the implementation of the NIH Strategic Plan for Data Science through scientific, technical, and operational collaboration with the institutes, centers, and offices that comprise the NIH. Dr. Gregoric advances research in computational biology, biophysics, and data science, mathematical and biostatistical methods, and biomedical technologies in support of the N. IGMS mission to increase our understanding of life processes. She received the 2020 Leadership in Biological Sciences Award from the Washington Academy of Sciences for her work in this role. And she was instrumental in the creation of the ODSS at NIH in 2018 and served to this as a senior advisor to the office until being named to her current position. Dr. Grigoric received her undergraduate degree in chemistry and mathematics from the University of Michigan and her PhD in physical chemistry from the University of Maryland. She completed a Lady Davis postdoctoral fellowship at Hebrew University in Israel and a Sloan postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Maryland Center for Advanced Research in Biotechnology. 
now the Institute for Bioscience and Biotechnology Research in Shady Grove, Maryland. Um, Dr. Gregoric, it's all yours. Hi, thank you so much, Gwen, and thank you um, to the organizers for the invitation. Would you like me to share my slides or would you like to project them? Either one is fine with me. Go ahead and share them, Susan. Okay, thank you very much. And then I'll just say next when it's time to advance. I'm really delighted that I'm able to provide perspectives on AI and data governance and infrastructure for the panel. Um, I'm sorry, am I sharing them or are you? I, I think I misunderstood you. Uh, go ahead and share them yourself if you'd like, but we can pull okay. them. Okay, I will share them. Sorry, yeah. delay. All right, it just takes a moment to get everything up and running and to switch the, um, the panel. Oh, goodness. Okay, so just give me a sec here. All right, does it, everything look good on your end? Yes, that's, that looks perfect. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, and just as a note, if by chance I freeze my internet acting up today. I, there's no particular reason why. It's a beautiful day here and fine weather, but for whatever reason, it keeps freezing. So I, I apologize in advance for any hiccups on, on my end or yours. So again, thank you again for um, inviting me to the panel. Uh, this is a, a really important topic, and I'm really happy that I can give you a little bit of our perspectives. And I'm sure that you're very, very familiar with the power of AI. I don't need to convince you of that and of its uh, tremendous achievements in science. In my field, which is the field of protein structure prediction, protein folding, protein dynamics, when I was a researcher, today we see some incredible advances due to artificial intelligence in general and generative AI and large language models and specifics, and in the ability to create very, very large scale structure templated databases of protein structures like what's being used in AlphaFold. Now it's possible, for example, just to take a sequence of a protein for which you do not know the structure, there's no experimental cryo-EM, there's no crystallography, there's no NMR necessarily. And for the most part, you know, if it's been seen in even some way before, you can predict the likely structure. This is super important for drug design and for understanding the relationships between structure and any potential biological mechanisms or functions. And, you know, and I'm just thinking here of some of the advances in AlphaFold, which I'm sure you've heard about, but um, EMSFold, which is a large language model, it may not be as accurate as AlphaFold, but it is orders of magnitude faster. And then there's you know, uh, work by um, Dave Baker and his group on Rosetta and all the iterations that really allow you to, to think seriously about designing of proteins. In addition to you know, my field, there's fields of clinical studies and clinical data informatics that have advanced significantly due to large language models which is, um, you know, using a lot of uh, training on uh, word triplets to predict next words, for example. But here, in particular, in the work of Lehman and colleagues, what they illustrate is that you can improve generative large language models that are very sort of generalizable um, with very specific clinical models. And they did a large language, oh, moderately large language model trained on MIMIC-3 and MIMIC-4 data and it did outperform the generative general AI large language models. And so that points to some things that I think people are really starting to explore, which is, hey, let's take take JetGPT and then improve it with our own data and our own models and then use it. And you're going to see this in the healthcare setting for, you know, helping doctors write clinical notes or um, review notes. In addition, you know, there are just a plethora of really interesting articles coming out and for example, the new journal, the new journal, New England Journal of Medicine has a new AI focused uh, journal, AI in Medicine. This allows researchers to explore the role of AI technologies in clinical and medical and digital health. And it provides examples of promising research and pitfalls of the application. And I don't have to convince you that large language models and in some cases AI generally does hallucinate. You, do, you have to really you know, think about bias, transparency, and um, what we're getting as output as a result of the large training sets. So that brings me to some of the challenges. There are some challenges 
and I'm sure you're aware of, aligning the data sets and algorithms to the use case in question is super important. It allows you to make sure that the data sets that you're going to use and train, if that's how you're going to construct the AI, is really represented of the ability to answer those questions. You're interested and I'm interested in integrating clinical and research and healthcare um, and related environmental data together. That's hard. You know that. Uh, and I'm living it too. And it's hard. And that is a challenge. There are bias to data and in assessing the algorithm, we're promoting ideas of ground truth and transparency and trustworthiness. There's a new a NIST AI risk framework for AI that's worth looking at and considering. There are other work going on in the European Union on trustworthy AI that's also worth considering. Something that uh, is coming up more and more is creating an inclusive AI workforce. And so I'll talk a little bit about that so that we bring all of our, our wonderful researchers across the United States and elsewhere uh, to, to join the workforce in developing AI. And finally, AI is a fast moving industry and so is the infrastructure of AI. There are new architectures, new chips being designed that are very specific for AI being implemented in Google, for example, Microsoft and other industries. And so what we're seeing today is surely, surely going to change in the next five years. And, and it is incredibly challenging to keep up with this fast pace, um, so much so that most of my day is now spent on the fast paced uh, world of AI. Maybe you don't know this necessarily, but um, well, I'm sure you know this, that AI needs data. It is a data hungry uh, research field, but maybe you don't know is that NIH through partnerships with cloud service providers such as Google, uh, AWS and Microsoft Azure have made over 206 petabytes. And that, that's actually data from about two months ago. So it's probably more now. 206 petabytes of data available across these three clouds. I'm just listing a few of the data types that you see. It's quite vast. It's quite a wild west. I would not say that this data is necessarily harmonized or easily integratable, but it is there. And just a, as a point of reference, one petabyte is about 230,000 high quality DVD movies. So we have a significant amount of data that can be harnessed for AI. Not that that's a, a possibility today. We have to build a lot of infrastructure in order to aggregate and utilize that da data, but it is there and it is a, an area of active interest at NIHN and the research community. Using data for AI um, and, and in other methodologies, as I'm sure you're aware, requires that those data, especially for clinical research, are collected in particular um, formats or particular ways. In particular, if we have a large study, let's just take, for example, the HEAL program, helping an addiction long term. There are many, there are thousands of investigators in the HEAL program, and they're all doing excellent research. Moving together as a field and working on a project that requires the input of thousands of investigators requires that we have to have some common understandings of what kind of questions we're asking and what kinds of data we're collecting so that we can actually form that that integration. And there are many ways to think about this. One of the ways we're thinking about this is through the practice of common data elements. They play a very important role in structured data collection. Common data elements are ways to ask questions like, how tall are you? And get a, a very formatted response. I am five foot five, standing up. So that's a way that we can all, you know, and that's a very simplistic way <laughs> that we can all discuss uh, data together in a meaningful way and then hopefully integrate it. For the work that we're doing in this space, an area that seems to be under um, utilized is the construction of social and environmental determinants of health both together so that we can actually answer meaningful questions. So let's just take a, an example um, that we've been working on is asthma. In order to have a large group of people working on asthma together, we have to have formatted questions in terms of describe your housing conditions, including the, the repair or disrepair of your uh, house, your exposure, exposures to pest, mold, and in addition po pollution and um, air quality. These are all incredibly important components of asthma. But so is understanding your um, proximity to healthcare facilities, your utilization of healthcare facilities, um, your uh, uh, your food um, security or insecurity, these are also important questions and, and having a way to, to have that conversation with structured data that is collected in a meaningful 
and harmonizable way is important. And so I just want to bring this up when you're thinking of your considerations. This is something we're thinking about quite a bit is how do we integrate determinants of health in a meaningful research capacity? So what's possible today with large data sets? I just want to give you two examples. Um, there, are, there are actually many examples at NIH, but these two, I'm hoping that you have some familiarity with. The first on the right-hand side is the MIDRIC Medical Imaging and Data Resource Center. It's an integrated, very large set of uh, radiological images. Most of these are CT scans. This was stood up as part of our COVID initiative. So of course we have a lot of body part images um, related to COVID, but now of course we're expanding that beyond COVID. What's really nice about this is that uh, there are 54,000 case studies or cases of, of research here that has generated 135,000 AI capable, harmonized and ready to use for the community uh, images. And so this is just, it's just one data set. But what we're doing with that data set is that we're integrating it into other resources like uh, the National COVID Cohort Collaborative, which happens to have electronic healthcare uh, and related data on COVID. So together we can get a much bigger and better picture of an individual who may have had a COVID trajectory, including long COVID, which is an important area for us to investigate. On the other side is all of us on the left-hand side. We have over 342,000 participants. The data that we're collecting is very structured, uh, very AI amenable. It's uh, electronic healthcare data, wearable data, like your Fitbit data or Epa Health. Um, survey data, we have a very wonderful survey for COVID, genomics data and family history. And so I'm showing you some examples of what researchers have done with the all of us data. There's just two, but there are many, including understanding migraines among adults with atopic dermatitis. It's a cross-sectional cross study in the all of us research program. This is actually done in, with European investigators using our data. And the one uh, below is the investigation of hypertension and type 2 diabetes uh, for folks who are at risk for derma dementia, sorry, dementia and all of us um, cohorts. So just two examples of how researchers are utilizing all of us or MEDRIC um, for their, their work. In addition, uh, we have been working across our funded investigators to make the existing data that they've been collected more AI um, ready. And so you'll see the number of institutes and centers that we have been working with. And I wanted to just give you one example from our Environmental Health uh, Science Institute is addressing the imbalance uh, and misdiagnosis uh, of data within the PROTECT database. This PROTECT database is an extensive data set of environmental and prenatal conditions of pregnant mothers data sets um, on in in sort of birth and pre-birth have a lot of missings. They're, they're missing lots of data. As you can imagine, it's very hard sometimes to have those regular check-ins about conditions and in, in prenatal conditions. And so what we're doing is, or what the researchers are doing actually is impugning um, these missing data using a super learning method developed by, in here you'll see the, uh, the researcher and his coworkers. And the idea is to fill the data gaps uh, in in the preterm and full term data sets, so that we have a better understanding of the the relationship in between environmental and prenatal conditions. Creating an inclusive uh, AI research workforce and uh, AI capabilities is a, an important goal for NIH, an important goal through our Aim Ahead program. The goal of the Aim Ahead program is to enhance participation and representation of researchers and communities who are underrepresented in general and to have them work both within their communities to utilize AI, but also to develop new AI algorithms and to enhance our data collection of data that could be used for AI from underrepresented communities. This is very much a ground-based effort. There's over a network of over a thousand researchers working in this program. Um, and what we hope to do is to address health disparities and inequities using artificial intelligence and also to improve the capabilities of this emerging technology with these communities. And you'll see that we have four main areas. Partnerships is incredibly important with the communities, as well as providing research, uh, research funding for these communities, training efforts and, and education in terms of how to use uh, AI technologies, and then the actual infrastructure that makes this all possible. 
I'll just, um, this is, I think this is, indeed, it is my last slide, and it's just my, uh, my short bit to brag a little bit about the program. In its second year, we have a number of fellowships that are awarded to early career researchers. One of our fellows, fellowship awardees is now an NSF early career awardee, so I feel like we are making um, headway and, and really promoting the careers of young scientists uh, to use AI and ML. We have 25 leadership fellowships uh, per, to prepare diverse leaders, and this may not necessarily be researchers. It could be activists in communities to help champion the use of AI in addressing uh, persistent health disparities. New and innovative pilots um, to test new algorithms in AI. These are for AI researchers working with or are underrepresented in communities. Finally, a very large Connects program, which uh, connects uh, folks who are interested in mentoring or being mentees and num numerous awardee uh, webinars and symposium. And with that, I just want to thank you very much for the opportunity. I'm looking forward to the panel discussion, and perhaps that's where the question and answers will occur. And go ahead and thank you so much again for moderating. I'm turning back over to you. I, I hope everything went well and I didn't freeze. Um, and, and thanks again. Thank you very much. And I'm Pleased to, we will take questions all together at the end. Um, so uh, right now, I'm pleased to introduce to Jorge Calzada, who is the Acting Associate Director for Platforms within the Office of Public Health Data Surveillance and Technology at the Centers for Disease, Disease Control and Prevention. This new office within the CDC seeks to advance the public health data strategy and data modernization initiatives by bringing together technology leaders with public health domain experts. Prior to joining CDC, Jorge spent the last 20 years building data science and machine learning expertise for organizations across several different sectors, including energy, market research, and artificial intelligence software startups. Jorge received his undergraduate degree in operations technology from Northeastern University, a Master of Science in Information Systems also from Northeastern, and a Master of Business Administration from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Very pleased to welcome Jorge. Thank you, Gwen. Um, I'm delighted to be here. I think the only thing that didn't get mentioned is that I'm brand new to CDC. I'm about seven weeks in, not just to CDC, but public health in general. I'm, my, by background, a technology leader um, and am brand new to public health. But one of the things we're doing within this new office is partnering technology leaders with our deep public health domain expertise that already exists within CDC to try to modernize our infrastructure. Um, why does this matter? Well, uh, we need to uh, systemically address some of the gaps that we saw exposed during the last pandemic response. Um, we, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that, um, how we think about that within our new office. So the, the workflow that we see within public health uh, is really ones around surveillance, so detecting and monitoring. So we have a division stood up for detecting and monitoring, and I'll talk through, uh, you know, we think about some of the AI applications there around anomaly detection. Uh, then investigate and respond to these outbreaks. Um, use that data to inform uh, and disseminate the data and the insights to both our state and local partners, but also the public at large and other researchers. Um, and be response ready. So that's really the goal of this, of this new office and why I'm, I'm here at the CDC. So this was all new to me and so I'm always happy to share this. It may not be new to you, but I was amazed to discover that the CDC actually has very little power to, inf uh, to force people to share data with them. All the data that we get from the CDC is entirely voluntary. It's the participation of our state uh, local, tribal, and territorial partners that allow us uh, to, 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 uh, to execute our mission in public health. So a little bit about this ecosystem. Um, and we, again, we saw this um, exposed during the, uh, the last response. Um, we see an ecosystem where healthcare organizations are still using fax machines to transmit data, uh, about 70%. And then may not sound like an exciting use case for AI, but it is to me. I would personally love to eliminate the fax machine from public health transmission. Um, 
One of the other things I was, the USDS has done a bunch of case studies and time studies, and what they discovered is that at our, the local level, at our Stolt partners, so state, tribal, local, territorial, um, the epidemiologists who work there spend 80% of their time doing data janitorial services. So data generation, data translation, data transmission, reviewing and approving that data. So we have a high degree of uh, manual intervention, of burden that we put on our local epidemiologists to share their data locally and then eventually with us at the CDC. So whenever I think of large human uh, burden, I naturally think, how can we offload that burden onto machines? So to me, these are the exciting use cases for AI that our office is responsible for. And again, we have missing uh, data elements that are really critical in understanding equity in our response. So things like race and ethnicity are missing in 30% of the, of the cases. And when you're trying to determine if there's any disparity in, in you know, how immunization is impacting one class or another, this data is, is absolutely critical. Um, so one of the prompts was about what are the, the areas of need? Well, I think the brittle inelastic data pipelines that come into the CDC is the biggest area of need for artificial intelligence, for multimodal intelligence, uh, artificial intelligence, things like computer vision, natural language processing, could all be brought to bear on this problem to make this pipeline much more elastic, much more response ready, uh, much less human intervention uh, in getting this data to us. Um, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll talk about some of the, the, the new roles and processes and how we make uh, the CDC AI ready uh, in a bit. So, like I said, I'm brand new here, but there are plenty of data scientists already existing within the CDC who have used uh, computer vision, natural language processing to develop some solutions to help us with our public health uh, mission. Uh, so one of the ones I'd like to talk about is an example of computer vision. And let it not be said that we are not without humor at the CDC, because the tagline to this harnessing machine learning to eliminate tuberculosis, otherwise known as Hamlet, is TB or not to be. Um, so there, we're leveraging computer vision to provide a quality assurance function um, on radiologists worldwide who are screening for tuberculosis. So there, the, uh, this is an uh, AI that runs in a batch mode. So overnight, it ingests a lot, all the x-rays that have been processed and scores uh, the performance of each radiologist and, and highlights areas uh, of discordance between the model and how they scored um, or how they diagnosed the tuberculosis. Uh, one of the other... Uh, use cases, and again, uh, around computer vision, uh, one that is near and dear to the CDC and our heritage around uh, res uh, yeah, outbreak response um, is Legionnaire's disease. So the Legionella bacteria causes a pretty uh, nasty case of pneumonia. It's caused by inhaling small droplets of, uh, of infected water or swallowing that infected water. Um, and when there's an outbreak, as you once you've detected the outbreak, you move to that investigate and respond mechanism. One of the tools that we've built to help our state and local partners respond faster to these outbreaks is identifying potential sources of that infected water. Um, and it turns out that large uh, cooling towers for uh, heating uh, HVAC, right? Uh, heating um, and AC in large buildings is a, is a breeding ground for this bacteria. So using uh, computer vision tied into uh, Bing's and Google Maps API to grab the satellite images, we're able to spot all the potential cooling towers where this out, um, outbreak might be occurring. Uh, I didn't think I'd have enough time, so <laughs> so the shit. Uh, but some of the other use cases um, is forecasting suicide risks. So building a, a real-time forecast model Real-time here is, is, is a matter of weeks or the same week um, where we're able to, to estimate a suicide risk based on uh, a lot of the data that we're observing. Um, our 
data scientists in the chronic uh, um, space are looking at environmental factors that contribute to uh, certain disease prevalences. And one of the things that they look at is how the built environment has contributed to it. So we look at like, things like sidewalk inventories, uh, using uh, computer vision models to detect the presence or the absence of sidewalks and, uh, and uh, providing scores to, to neighborhoods. Um, and again, some, some other use cases for natural uh, language processing where we use word embeddings and uh, classification trees to provide some uh, missing uh, information, especially here around opioid um, use. Um, so with that, I think I answered most of the prompt, but some of the things that uh, when we think about what's missing within uh, CDC, specifically around being ready to apply AI at, at a large scale, it's really um, new roles. So I'm hiring some of the uh, machine learning engineers, ML ops engineers, which is probably a new role uh, to CDC, uh, designers, uh, product people, because we think about these as products to be consumed. Um, and then systems, it's, uh, I, I spent a lot of time in data science and I saw it evolve from an artisanal craft where you were building models and then if you wanted them run, you'd go to the data scientists and ask them to run it. Well, that doesn't really scale. We, the, where industry has gone is really this idea of an AI factory where you have a machine learning operations platform that governs the entire life cycle of machine learning from design, development, deployment to make sure that you build upfront uh, for this idea that it will be operationalized. Um, and so it needs to fit into the existing code base. It needs to play well. It needs to be built for, for scalability, for safety, for ethics. You do that up front at the design phase. You don't go chasing it after the fact, after you released it out into the wild. Um, so those are uh, infrastructures that I'm looking to build. Um, but also simple things like the ability to host solutions for our state and local partners. Uh, because they often um, don't have that ability within their own departments to deploy a solution. So we are essentially mimicking the services of a software as a service company within the CDC. So thank you very much, Gwen. Thank you. Uh, that was impressive for just having come to your position. Um, and we really appreciate your being here. Uh, our next speaker is Janet Haven. Janet is the Executive Director of Data and Society and a member of the National Artificial Intelligence Advisory Committee, which advises President Biden and the National AI Initiative Office on a range of issues related to artificial intelligence. She has worked at the intersection of technology policy governance and accountability for 20 years, both domestically and internationally. Before joining Data and Society, where she previously served as Director's Director of Programs and Strategy, Janet spent more than a decade at the Open Society Foundations. There she oversaw funding strategies and grant making related to technology's role in strengthening civil society and played a substantial role in shaping the field of data and technology governance. Janet started her career in technology startups in Central Europe and lived in the region for more than 10 years, deepening her understanding of the ways the internet and algorithmic technologies impact communities outside the United States. She sits on the board of the Public Lab for Open Technology and Science and advises a range of nonprofit organizations. She holds an MA from the University of Virginia and a BA from Amherst College. Thank you very much, Janet, for being here. It's all yours. Thank you. Um, my pleasure, Gwen, and thanks so much for asking me to participate. Um, and, and thank you to the other panelists. These talks have been great, and I'm, I'm excited that, that my talk, which is really focused on the issue of governance of AI and, and kind of where we are at in, um, in governing um, these systems uh, really picks up on a lot of the themes that others have raised. So that's, um, that's really fantastic. And, and thank you for that. Um, very briefly, I'm the executive director of Data and Society. We're an independent nonprofit research institute. We study the um, social impacts of data centric technologies and automation. Um, we really center 
people in our work. We tend to work through a social science lens. Um, and we also do policy engagement work, um, which is where my uh, participation in the National AI Advisory Committee comes in. And I should say, as I believe I am actually required to do, I am not speaking on behalf of uh, the National AI Advisory Committee. I am speaking um, in my individual capacity. Um, so I should I should always say that. So I want to start um, by saying something, set, setting us up with something a bit obvious, I think, which is that how we govern AI and the rules that we're setting to govern AI is a really big issue right now, both in the public discourse and in governance around the world. Um, we're seeing a lot of movement around AI governance in both um, in, in the United States, uh, particularly in the executive branch and within agencies and also in the EU. And, and I think it's important to say that the reason for this is that there is an increasing recognition that AI is a democracy issue. Um, we're seeing concerns about discrimination against protected classes via algorithmic systems. Um, we see amplification of mis and disinformation on algorithmically mediated social media platforms. And there are a range of other ways that um, we've seen and, and documented um, harms that AI systems and algorithmic decision-making systems have, um, have brought about. And at the same time, um, we know, as, as our other panelists have talked about, the incredible benefits that um, society can reap from, from AI systems. And so that need to um, both protect and to create space for innovation is, is critical. Um, technology governance is not new. AI raises some novel questions and challenges, but the core issues of protecting our rights and ensuring enforceable accountability of technical systems and of the entities designing and deploying them remains. And, and to be very honest, we haven't gotten that right yet. So this is a real moment of opportunity because of the urgency around the regulatory um, and governance conversation. So two points that I would, I would sort of put on the table um, to start with. One is that the Biden-Harris administration is, um, has put out a call for a request for information because they are planning to develop a national AI strategy, a whole of government approach to AI. Um, and my position is that this is a moment where we have an opportunity as a society to articulate a core set uh, of values and of commitments to equity, to access to opportunity, and to a rights-based framework that I think should guide American AI policy. The second thing that I think is important in, in framing out that, that national AI strategy is that we need to build an AI research and development ecosystem that prioritizes the understanding of societal and social impacts of AI, um, including environmental health that works alongside technical advancement and innovation. Without understanding the impact on people and on the environment, we really cannot govern AI justly or sustainably. Um, so what I'm gonna do is just give a quick tour of the highlights of our current AI governance situation. Um, and I'm gonna start with the EU because they are way out ahead of everyone else um, on, on that front. Um, the, the EU is working on what's, what's known as the EU AI Act. Um, and in fact, yesterday, the European Parliament passed a draft uh, law, um, a draft version of that law. Um, the final version of that law is not expected to be passed until the end of this year. And the important thing to know about the EU AI Act is that it's, um, it's based around a, uh, a risk-based framework as a core assessment tool um, of AI systems in context. Um, so they are not regulating a technology, particularly they're re regulating the use of that technology. And they've defined four levels of risk classification from high to low within the EU AI Act. Um, and I think one of, one of the things that's probably critical for this conversation in this, this uh, community is that um, the members of the European Parliament expanded in their, in their negotiations in May over this, expanded the classification 
of high risk areas to include harm to people's health, safety, fundamental rights, or to the environment. Um, and that, that was, I think, an important expansion to include um, the environment. In the United States, we're, we're not quite as far along. So um, a, there are a couple of major developments, um, what one of them Susan mentioned. Um, and I'm gonna start with the, uh, the release uh, by the Office of Science and Technology Policy in uh, October of last year of 2022 of the Blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights, um, which came out under the leadership of Dr. Alondra Nelson. Um, the, this presents a rights-based approach to governing AI. Um, the blueprint is not enforceable law, I should say. It's essentially a, um, a, a policy um, a, a policy blueprint, um, but it is, it is not, um, most of it is not enforceable. It calls for five core protections and guarantees for the American public around AI. Um, protection against algorithmic discrimination, safe and effective AI systems, uh, data privacy, notice and explanation, which means you should know when an automated system is being used and understand how and why it contributes to outcomes that impact you. And um, what's broadly known as a human in the loop, um, human alternatives, consideration and fallback. That is, there's somebody that you can speak to if you, um, if you have a concern about an AI system that's making a judgment about you. Currently, none of these things are in place. We've seen some movement on algorithmic discrimination through an executive order that President Biden put out in February, which directed all agencies to protect the American public against algorithmic discrimination using existing civil rights law. And that was actually quite a, um, a big step and a big departure to, um, to draw on existing law and ask for it to be put into action. Um, when we're seeing harms coming from algorithmic systems around discrimination. So that, that's a big step. And we've also seen some agencies say very clearly that they intend to, to do that and to take that forward. Um, the National Institutes of Standard and Standards and Technology, NIST, um, released, and Susan mentioned this, the, the um, AI risk management framework. Um, in January of this year. And that followed um, a very long and I think very thorough consultation process with industry and with some independent groups. Um, the important things to know about the, the risk management framework is that um, it, is, it is also not enforceable and it is not intended to be enforceable. It is a standards-based um, tool, governance tool. Um, and in fact, the, the, it is intended to be quite broad and applicable across a number of different sectors and, um, and, and uses. And so what NIST, the stage we're at right now is that NIST is asking um, a number of, of actors in the field to take the risk management framework and apply it to their own, um, their own situation, their own company or, or product um, to essentially develop a set of, of user profiles or case studies. Um, and and so I, I see the I see the risk management framework as a really excellent place to start a standards conversation. Um, it also uses a, obviously a risk uh, framework, um, but unlike again unlike the vision for the EU AI Act, which will become law, or the the intention of something like the AI Bill of Rights, which is rights based. Um, the, the NIST standard is not enforceable. And that really leaves a lot of space for interpretation and also for you know, questions about how accountability um, uh, mitigation and redress happens when harms, um, harms occur in, in AI systems. And so finally, Congress is also in on the act. Um, we've seen there have been congressional hearings with AI leaders. We'll see more of those, I think. Um, as congressional members are trying to figure out what it is that they're regulating and and also what what power they have over the kinds of um, concentration we see in the in the in the AI industry of data and compute money and talent in a few um, you know a few AI companies a very few companies that are essentially holding most of the cards right now. Um, I think that we're not as close to actual legislation around AI, given how hard it's been to pass even basic data privacy laws and other types of fundamental protections um, in, the, in the technology governance space at the federal level. But what I think we do have right now 
is a huge opportunity to bring environmental concerns to the forefront of these conversations. They've been um, in the mix, but haven't been foregrounded. Um, AI, uh, environmental impact of AI is usually mentioned in AI governance text, but a major obstacle that we have is a lack of information about what the environmental impact of AI systems actually is. We don't have good measurement systems for this at all. Um, and, and to that end, the OECD um, has formed an AI expert group on climate and compute. Um, they released a report last fall focused on that question of how do we improve the overall understanding of the environmental impact of AI systems. And, and so that report um, is really, I think is a valuable read. It distinguishes between the direct environmental impacts of developing and using AI systems and the indirect um, costs and benefits of AI applications, which I think really gets us back to that issue that we need to understand the um, the social impacts, the societal impacts of AI to be able to govern it. Um, even choosing what the measurement standards are of um, in, in terms of environmental impact of AI systems is really a question about people and society and less about um, the technology. Um, so so I think just to just to wrap it up, um, a couple of big questions I think that, that we're facing as, a, as in this community is how do we better understand and factor in the environmental costs of AI in this emerging um, governance ecosystem? And how do we ensure that those societal impacts are visible and are central to um, the governance design? And I think equally important, um, and, and Susan also talked about this in her talk, the design of, of AI governance systems has really not been participatory. The loudest voices that we have are those from the AI industry itself. Um, the people who are most directly impacted by these technologies should have a seat at the table. Um, and so I think there's, there's a very big question that needs to be solved um, in, in governance design. How do we ensure participation in governance in meaningful ways that truly shifts power that isn't just a, a box checking exercise? Thanks, Quinn. Thank you, Janet. Our next speaker is, uh, our, and our last speaker is Dr. Suzanne Dorsey, who is Deputy Secretary of the Maryland Department of the Environment. She manages a portfolio that encompasses regulation and enforcement of state and federal environmental laws, multi-jurisdictional restor restoration projects, climate policy, and environmental justice. Before this role, Dr. Dorsey worked with the agency's Water and Science Administration on Chesapeake Bay restoration and on major issues that require cross-agency collaboration on climate resiliency. She previously was executive director of the Harry H. Hughes Center for Agroecology at the University of Maryland, and also was executive director of the Baldhead Island Conservancy and Smith Island Land Trust for 11 years. Dr. Dorsey has been a former commissioner of the North Carolina Division of Coastal Management and a professor at University of North Carolina at Wilmington and Salem College. She has her bachelor's degree in biology from Drew University, her master's degree in marine estuary and environmental science from the University of Maryland, and her PhD in oceanography from the State University of New, at, of New York at Stony Brook. Uh, it's all yours. Thanks, thanks, friend. If it's possible, can you guys uh, present my slides? really appreciate that. Um, and if not, I, I can just go without. Um, so um, Janet, thank you. Um, you, uh, oh, perfect, thanks. Um, we were mentioning the role of uh, environment in AI and, and I'm, I'm really gonna pose a potential opportunity um, and really um, am grateful to be able to um, test this, uh, this idea out with all the experts on this panel and, and participating in the workshop. Um, so the Chesapeake Bay, you can go to next slide. Um, Chesapeake Bay restoration is one of the, the nations and, and honestly the world's most um, complex and um, I would even argue successful examples of ecosystem restoration, uh, multi-jurisdiction ecosystem restoration. The restoration effort has been in place for 40 years. And I, I wanna start um, centered on equity. Um, 
we recently had a report that analyzed uh, com communities in our Bay watershed, which encompasses um, state, six states and the um, District of Columbia. Um, and the communities in the watershed that have the highest equity scores on EJ screens, whether it's EPAs, uh, Maryland has one, University of Maryland has one. And one of the really interesting findings is there is a two-way relationship between areas with equity issues, um, areas where there may be high poverty and the lack of success of restoration and then the health. So absolutely, we are beginning to build a strong case for the relationship between equity, environmental health and human health. It goes absolutely both ways. Where do we fail to meet our pollution reduction goals? Often in communities that have been redlined or su have suffered systemic racism. So the Chesapeake Bay restoration is really impressive and important primarily because it's based on a very rigorous quantification and verification system. In fact, every restoration practice has a scientifically backed quantification system and often in addition has um, uh, measured outputs as well. Um, so for 40 years, we've been implementing uh, restoration. We've had some really important um, changes over the years. One of them was in 2010, the um, establishment of a total maximum daily load or TMDL, which is the pollution diet regulated by EPA. And then most recently, there was a, a report by the Science Technical and Advisory Committee of the Bay Program that had a couple of conclusions that I really want to get into. And then at the end of this, posed the question of, is this an opportunity to apply AI to environmental restoration goals? Next slide, please. So I'm, I'm not going to go over the, the details, but it's, it's a complex system, right? It's a system that starts far upstream in New York um, and it, it uh, concludes at the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay in Virginia. There is a substantial amount of science going back well over 100 years, studying the ecosystems, the responses, um, the habitats and the uh, critters that live and depend on the bay, as well as now a growing set of social science that looks at the connectivity between environmental well being and human well being. As I said, there are quantifiable outcomes that are we're seeking with our bay restoration and metrics for um, how we achieve those outcomes. Next slide, please. Um, the approach for the Chesapeake Bay restoration has really evolved to, to look at uh, things from a, of a integrated perspective, right? So there is a Bay model that is frequently updated and improved. There are real time observations in the environment. And then there's the measurement of the outcomes. And after all, after 40 years, we have determined that, you know, our restoration outcomes have not been achieved to the extent that our model expected them to be achieved. Next slide, please. If you can go back one. One of the factors, of course, that has caused um, uncertainty and gaps is the impact of climate change, which 40 years ago was not integrated into restoration. So as uh, the dark green line demonstrates, the restoration um, path needed to be adjusted based on the impact of climate change, which requires, it, it basically makes everything harder and it moves the goalpost. So you can see that over time, we've had to adjust the rate of restoration, increase the amount of our pollution uh, diet over time. Next slide, please. So with all this, and, and again, uh, um, just on the left hand side of this is the public policy, the tools that we use to achieve environmental restoration across all the jurisdictions. And on the right hand side is a example of the response. And this CESA report that came out this year 
highlighted the fact that despite there being improvingly sophisticated modeling, the response gap is uh, obvious in almost all of the outcomes that we're looking at. So where we are ending up versus where we modeled to, to be, generally we are underachieving our restoration goals, even though we've made significant progress in achieving um, health and, and habitat metrics for the Chesapeake Bay. Next slide, please. So this is an amazing time. There is in the Chesapeake Bay restoration, there is a, a milestone and that milestone takes place in 2025. And so right now we have the opportunity to reimagine what restoration could be and how we want to move forward, both with the metrics we use to achieve restoration outcomes and the outcomes that we're going to be benchmarking to determine whether or not we're a success. Certainly equity becomes much more of an um, important benchmark because as I said, it is not only linked to human well-being, but it's also linked to environmental well-being. Next slide, please. So my question, and uh, I'm with all of you esteemed um, artificial intelligence experts, that but my question and in collaboration with University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science is, um, is this the time to integrate AI to support the environmental outcomes and public health outcomes that we're seeking? So we have a set of environmental actions that are backed by science and continuously improved. I would like to see an enhanced and expanded environmental real-time environmental monitoring system that includes scaled, remote, as well as in situ um, monitoring to communicate with our model. Um, and, and at what point, my question to my uh, data scientists is, at what point does the model become irrelevant? Can we move to AI or can we? Um, can AI identify vulnerability gaps and opportunity to inform environmental action. And again, this needs to be both on the environment side and the linked human health side of the equation. Next slide, please. So here's an opportunity, a foundation of consistent metrics, of uniform metrics, um, both on the implementation side as well as on the measured outcome side. It is a complex system, but a system that is well studied and well understood, even as it relates to climate change. And we are right now looking for the next generation of environmental restoration and public health tools to inform our daily decision making, our annual decision making, and our funding strategies at the um, state and watershed scale. Next slide, please. Thanks a lot. Appreciate your time. Thank you to all of our speakers. Um, we have about 15 minutes for questions. Um, I wonder if I have a few from um, the internet. Uh, and remember that uh, if you are on Slido, you have a um, Q and A uh, button at the at the bottom where you can um, put your questions, and I'll, we'll get to those. Um, if there are any questions in the room, um, Lily, how will I know about those? We'll let you know when, and you'll see a hand raised. Oh, there. Okay, so uh, Daryl, I see your hand. Thank you. Uh, great set of talks. I really appreciate the additional info, but Susan, I had a question for you um, initially. Um, and it was the first time that I sort of had this feeling that I guess contemporary Americans have with regard to, uh, you know, being scared by the power of AI. And so I spent four years at Vanderbilt, you know, in biophysics, circular dichroism, NMR, you know, crystallography. And <laughs> when you put forth that proposition um, with respect to uh, the new tools, um, I actually um, had a moment there. 
And so could you say a few words about um, the actual comparison with regard to uh, the models, the protein-protein interaction models, and say crystallography in terms of the agreement between the two, and what might that portend for postdocs going forward? Uh, absolutely. So speaking in general about the um, the particular algorithms, AlphaFold, uh, EMSFold, and Rosetta, Rosetta, it's got a longer name, Rosetta X single or something like that. I think that's the question. Like, what is, is your question? Um, comparing the algorithms where they're strong, where they're weaknesses, and, and where there's real a real need for research in the future. I think that's what you're, you're getting at, correct? Yes, thank you. Awesome. <laughs> Okay, great. So um, AlphaFold, and, and this is this is really, you, you probably remember the CASP structure prediction. Um, I don't know, competition is, is the right word um, that I actually participated in as a postdoc. So it's kind of a, a, a longstanding competition. You're given a sequence and you have to predict the three-dimensional structure. AlphaFold came along and, you know, it, 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 it started with a pretty reasonable guess um, let's get a template and then refine those with some energy minimizations. And it did okay, but then it realized that really this is a pattern matching problem. And so if I take everything that's been been crystallized, and I develop template structures, and then I do do pattern matching um, in really sophisticated ways with AI, uh, the work that they've done has been outstanding and really, really, um, you know, really quite predictive, especially if these if certain elements of the structures, are found in many different proteins. And, and that, so that's really great for structures that have been crystallized. Um, then comes um, large language models, which are incredibly fast. If you play with chat GPT, it, it gives you answers in a fa fairly rapid capability. So taking those large language models um, and really trying to look for ways in which the algorithms can predict orphan proteins or proteins with very limited sequence homology it's quite good, but it's never. But when it looks at um, algorithms that are already crystallized and AlphaFold is really quite superior, uh, uh, the large language models don't do as good, um, which is, you know, for me just a little bit surprising, uh, since it's a, you know, the way that it's structured, it, it should actually, I would imagine, outperform. So, I'm thinking that a, an interesting area of research, if I were a researcher, would be to really look at the structure of the large language models and how they're incorporating data from databases. And I really would love to see researchers incorporating literature into the large language models, including and the data from the databases. I think there's just an enormous potential there to improve um, large language models and just to really advanced AI. And Rosetta Stone takes a, a slightly different approach where the the um, the language models are more on the sequence and not on the structure so that they can actually predict and design new proteins um, with new sequences. And so, you know, it's it's a really interesting um, field. And I think there's going to be a lot of fast moving capabilities here. And, and where I'm really excited is about using the in integration of, of literature that's, you know, peer reviewed and, and considered highly vetted with data and databases to, to advance curation to advance structure prediction or just to advance um, new technologies in, in improving large language models. So I hope that kind of gets to your question. Thank you very much. It did. Next question comes from Jana Asher. Are there any efforts perhaps through the UN to create an international framework around AI ethics and deployment? Uh, I can I can jump in on that. Um, uh, so there are yes, there certainly are a lot of discussions about that right now. Um, the OECD has released a set of has has created a set of AI uh, ethics principles, which um, are pretty high level. Um, right now. Um, there are, I would say there's a lot of focus on, on national strategies. So for instance, the UK has also put out a, um, a kind of national AI plan. Um, on the other hand, there have been a number of calls um, recently. And I, I think, you know, to some extent, this has been led by, uh, again, AI industry leaders for a 
international regulatory um, body uh, that would um, govern AI or provide a governance framework for AI um, internationally. Um, that is still very much at the idea phase. The UK just uh, offered to host a summit on that um, this fall. I'm not sure if that's going to happen or not. Um, yeah. But I, I think there, I mean, my personal feeling is I think there are a lot of pros and cons to that when you are talking about a um, essentially something of a borderless technology. And uh, and and I think the, the challenge, of course, with principles of which there are many and many companies have released them as well is, is they're just not enforceable. Um, and so I think that is the you know, the draw of something like the EU AI Act of, um, you know, of, of the, you know, seeing things like the executive order that mandates um, protections against algorithmic discrimination. Is th those are the kinds of behaviors and actions by governments that are going to have real impact on people's lives. Thank you. And then we have a question from Saski Sharma uh, that's related, but perhaps more for Suzanne. What should be the ideal framework that can be implemented in developing countries for creating AI-based models for environmental restoration and protecting the vulnerable hotspots of biodiversity? Yeah, I, I think that's a really great question. I, I know that NASA is looking at um, some uh, remote sensing tools that are connected to biodiversity. So, you know, obviously data is, is essential. Um, but uh, the second thing is, um, you know, quantification, beginning to quantify uh, actions. And, and those are tools that we can uh, begin to amplify. There's a, a Chesapeake Bay um, a report card uh, put out by University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science. And that report card is being widely used across the globe. And again, building on these tools of quantification, verification, and outcome monitoring, I think that allows us to begin to apply. Um, but, you know, I would argue starting in a data rich place like the Chesapeake Bay watershed will certainly inform those actions associated with um, goals, um, large scale um, go goals, especially in developing nations. Thanks. Um, Shirog has been waiting. Hi there, I'm Chirag. I'm not part of the panel, uh, but spoke yesterday and uh, I'm a bioinformaticist from Harvard University. So I have a, a question. It's great to see our uh, federal resources being spent towards AI and, and data science. Um, as Dr. Cozalda, you will know the CDC has um, it, it supported, fostered impactful surveillance data used for environmental health decisions, such as the CDC and Haines. For example, every week, you know, in our top journals, JAMA, New England Journal of Medicine, it's not unlikely we'll see a study that has been done on, on these data. So I, 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 I ask, um, you know, what types of AI or data science resources are being reinvested into, you know, those types of resources to, for us to enhance our invent, uh, environmental decision making? And sort of a second broader question about our infrastructure building, you know, how do, how do we use these uh, resources that we're talking about to better have data sets talk to each other, like fantastic um, resources that uh, Dr. Gregoric, you, you presented of all of us. You know, what are the AI tools, data resources that we need to be using to make sure that NHANES talks to all of us and back and forth? Thanks very much. Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll adjust the second one first. Um, that's a real challenge within the CDC as well. We have uh, I, I was, again, amazed to discover that CDC stands for Centers for Disease Control, not the center. Uh, so we have roughly, I think, somewhere between 12 and 15 different center, centers, institutes, and offices with their own data models, uh, their own funding, their own different disparate capabilities. Uh, some have data engineers, some do not. Um, so that th there are some real data silos that exist, and one of the opportunities, I think, for our division to, uh, to, um, to address is connecting all these disparate data sources. So there's a couple of ways to do that. You can build a centralized analytics platform, which is, you know, pretty straightforward, um, or a novel approach that I'm investigating is a semantic integration. 
So uh, rather leave the data where it is, because there's good reasons for the different data models that are very mission centric in the support of the different centers. Instead, represent the data through an ontology. Connect that ontology through a graph database structure, right? So now you've built a semantic knowledge graph that can be queryable through a query language like Sparkle, and then it in turn talks to the data fabric and pulls the right data. So that's what I'm thinking about as far as how we integrate these disparate data sources. It's, we use ontologies to tie them all together. I can ask, sorry, should, should I go ahead? Okay, um, just to sort of build on what my colleague is saying from CDC, um, and we're probably fairly closely aligned, not surprising. I think the, the science, the world of data science is moving in this way. And with 27 different institute centers and offices and many, many different programs, we see this problem repeat itself quite a bit. Um, and so the work that we're doing right now is, of course, to create federated data infrastructures, just exactly what, as you're saying, where we're looking to integrate data across different different uh, resources like all of us and outside of our programs, the NHANES study, we've been looking at um, harmonizing and integrating data models and uh, the semantic capabilities is certainly something that um, we have been working on as well, harmonizing common data elements and, and ontologies. There's a lot of really good work. Chris Mungle, for example, um, I think he's at Berkeley. Uh, has been doing some really good work on uh, large language models and ontologies, and I can tell you that is a fast and exciting moving field. Another thing that we're thinking of, and I just want to call out my colleagues at the new uh, ARPA-H, is investing in large language models for data harmonization and integration by looking at ways in which we can integrate together very many data models. And so I think you're going to see a lot of really good research in this area, um, rather than the 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 ways that we should, we have done it in the past, which is brute force harmonization um, through people skills, which is incredibly slow and painful and expensive. And I think we can we can utilize a lot more modern technologies and algorithms to to speed that up considerably. Um, we have a wealth of questions, and I'm afraid we're not going to get to everyone, but um, I, I think we can sneak in one more. And this is again for Dr. Gregoric. Do you have recommendations on how exposure information could be most optimally captured in medical records for later AI analysis? Does oh my, I'm so excited you asked that question because um, we're updating our strategic plan for data science um, to e exactly call this out as something that is needed, that we really absolutely need to integrate um, exposure and environmental, uh, what we're thinking of is, is um, determinants of health into our electronic healthcare records at least for our research side, EHRs are designed mostly for payer, um, for the payer, pro, you know, insurance companies, as well as um, for healthcare provider communication. We are trying to leverage those, but we we are having a big push. We're talking with the Office of the National Coordinator on social determinants of health integration into EHRs, as well as environmental determinants of health. So this is something we're calling out. I can say we haven't solved this problem, but I'd love to have the community um, work with us on this journey because this is incredibly important. So thank you very much for bringing that topic up. All right, so we are out of time. Um, I want to thank all of our panelists one more time. Uh, we're very grateful to have had you as part of the workshop um, and uh, I hope you will stay for the rest of it. Um, we have one more session, but I believe it's after um, a short break. Um, let me make sure. Right here. Session, oh, we are heading right into the next section. Okay, so stick around for the next session. Well, I guess I'll go on and get us started. Um, thank you so much. We'll we'll make a, a quick transition here. Um, so hello, um, I'm Allison Motzinger Reif. Um, I'm chief of the biostatistics and computational biology branch um, at NIEHS. I've really enjoyed the opportunity to listen in on um, the talks and panels so far, I mean, and I'm equally as excited to hear from our upcoming speakers um, in session five. So this is really a group that, that knows a lot about both sort of technologies for collecting data and really sort of how to implement those, those technologies in a, in a variety of settings that I'm, I'm really excited to hear more about. 
So I think it really brings a, a number of things together here. Our first speaker um, is Dr. Loren Lorenzo Henkla um, from the Department of Defense. Um, he does a lot of work on wearables um, technologies, um, is in sort of the program executive office um, for chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear defense um, diagnostics. Um, and so I'm really excited to hear what he has to say. Dr. Um, Henkla, are you with us? Again, as we've done all along, let's try to, to hold back questions um, until all the speakers are completed on um, their talks, and then we can have some time for, for Q&A. Okay, yes, this is Lauren, just doing a mic check. Can you hear me? Over. We can hear you. We can't see anything yet. Can't see anything. All right, bear with me one second to try to share my screen. Of course. It was there for just a moment. Okay, how is that? Can you see my screen? Nope, it still says it's starting to share the screen. Double click to enter full screen mode. There we can see it. We see the PowerPoint. It's not in presentation mode, but we do see the PowerPoint. Perfect. Okay. All right. Um, good deal. Um, first off, good morning, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to talk about some of the stuff that us within the Department of Defense and specifically within the DOD's Chemical and Biological Defense Program, some of the stuff we're working on within AI, ML, and more specifically with monitoring warfighter human health readiness and performance. I have a handful of charts here over the next five, maybe 10 minutes, just to kind of walk through, give you an idea of some of the stuff that we are working on, some of our ideas, and maybe even some of our challenges here at the back end. Um, so as I mentioned, I am with the Joint Program Executive Office for Chemical, Biological, Radiological, Nuclear Defense. It is a mouthful, but basically we are part of an enterprise where that our mission space is protecting people, protecting warfighters from hazardous threats that are present or possibly placed in the environment by somebody wanting to do something, you know, bad. We all just live through or depending on your perspective, <clears throat> excuse me, we are living through, you know, the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. I know the pandemic has formally closed out, but if you have small kids, it seems like the illness thing is just nonstop now, but that, that was just one kind of, you know, primer that was very much open in everyone's mind and in everyone's lives on one aspect of our mission space, the bio threat, and how it can absolutely just affect everything you do, affects readiness, affects everything that we're able to do, both as, you know, people, as well as the military's ability to be prepared and be able to respond to whatever mission that may arise. There's also our mission space that deals with having chemicals that are within the environment and being able to monitor and protect people from those things. So in terms of what we actually do, we are in what the DOD calls the advanced development space. So we are responsible for the joint services, the Marine Corps, Navy, Army, and Air Force, as well as our special operators, um, fielding equipment to be able to protect them from CBR and threats. So we basically have two portfolio elements. There is a medical portfolio and what we call a non-medical portfolio. So medical, that involves diagnostic equipment, uh, prophylaxis, vaccines, those types of medical things. Non-medical are suits, boots, gloves, masks, sensors, and other things that look at threats in the environment. Wearable sensors for us is very interesting and it kind of spans the medical and non-medical. And this was an area that, um, actually accelerated very much for us as part of the COVID-19 pandemic. We're, I feel like, kind of a uh, group person that was in the background of the COVID-19 response that began in um, 2020. It, it's, I think, fairly known that the DOD helped a lot with that response. Our organization, the JPEO, as well as the Chem Bio Defense Program, 
we were front and center with doing a lot of that COVID-19 response. We've also, through our partnerships and other things, we um, helped develop um, some of the initial technology that actually went into the vaccines and other things. Um, but one of sort of the interesting spaces that came out of the COVID-19 pandemic was a, a investment in wearables. We were looking at wearable sensors, you know, fitness trackers, Apple watches, those types of devices that are worn on people. And pre-pandemic, we were looking at that to try to predict when someone has been exposed to some kind of hazardous chemical or when they may be getting sick. And that sickness was more focused on potentially being exposed to some kind of biological threat. When the pandemic happened, we very pivoted, we very quickly pivoted away from biological warfare agents to COVID-19. And so what we found is that's an additional way for us to really sense and it can really start to fundamentally change how that we protect our warfighters from the CBRN, Kim Bio, Rad Nuke um, threats that are out there. It's an extra layer, it's an extra tool that's in our toolkit. We have lots of sensors that we can deploy all across, you know, some area of operation looking for threats in the environment. They're somewhat expensive. They work very, very well. Um, now this is an extra layer, an extra tool that we could apply, say, a $500 smartwatch on someone and have that, if we can do all of our homework and get the network equipment and other things, the technical backend set up, we can now monitor each individual person and have that feed into some larger kind of command and control system to be able to monitor for emerging threats. So it's very, very interesting um, for us within the combined defense program. Now, if you take a sort of step back and sort of look from a technical lens, more or less, we say wearables, we're really focused on physiological monitoring. And basically what that is, is a device of some kind that a person wears. It's either on or very, maybe very slightly penetrates their skin and it feeds data to an algorithm. That algorithm is finely tuned for some threat, some, some thing that it's looking for. And that algorithm then passes information via some kind of network architecture so that someone can make a decision. This is all about influencing, improving, you know, performance, the health, the lives of our warfighters. This is more or less kind of the general flow, devices to algorithms, and then to a decision maker via some kind of architecture. When you piece all of those together, you get a capability. And I call this, we call this our sunshine chart. This is sort of the wheel of capability of investments that are across the DOD in partnership with academia and industry on things to be able to reduce costs to the DOD, decrease risk to our force, risk to mission, as well as increase our readiness and just in general, save lives. You have the chem bio defense programs kind of primary mission that's up here in the top left, sort of some of these red shaded, but there are other investments that are in our partners that are across the DOD looking at heat strain. That is a huge problem within the DOD. Um, other things like human performance, cognitive performance, tracking when someone has become a casualty, um, all these different things, they run on basically the same model. You got to get a device on a person, feed it to an algorithm. The algorithm will be finely tuned to one of these things that's on this wheel. And then you move the data, move the information via some kind of architecture so somebody can make a decision. One of our problems and one kind of one of our challenge points and something that uh, my program very much is focused on trying to address is how can we move that data off the skin into some place where that these algorithms are hosted? How can we get the data from those algorithms to some kind of command center of sorts so that people can have insight at the individual level and they can also have insight sort of at like an enterprise population level. That is really, really, really challenging for the DOD. And it makes sense if you think about our mission set. We have people spread all over the place. People are under the sea, on the sea, in the air, in the US, in all these different locations that are literally all over the globe. And Sometimes people have access to, say, a cell phone and AT&T wireless, and they can use that whole technical backend to move the data. Other times they can't. So it's really, really challenging to get the data off the skin, 
pass it to an algorithm that could be deployed, say, on a watch, on a device, could be on someone's phone, could be maybe on a local server or local laptop that's maybe like on a ship, on an installation, or it could be in a cloud. Um, we have to take that into account. We have to take all of these into account because we have people spread across everywhere. And what we saw with COVID is the bio threat in particular, it doesn't really matter where you are. The bio threat can spread very quickly and it can affect someone on a ship, <laughs> maybe worse than um, someone that may be deployed in Hawaii in a training event. So it really is a challenge for us, but it's also an opportunity because it will buy us time. If we can figure out how to make all the technical backend, how that we can coordinate together all these different algorithms, I, I think I heard um, someone during the previous question and answer mention something about an AI ML platform, you know, like an analytics engine to run all these different algorithms on. We can figure out all of that. It is an excellent opportunity to monitor for when someone's been exposed to can buy a rad new hazard, maybe some kind of other chemical based hazard, burn pits. Um, for those that are tracking that, that's a big deal. There, there's a lot of things that our warfighters get exposed to that wearables can help counter. It's very, very exciting. It's a huge opportunity for us to improve the overall general health and readiness of our warfighters, but it also comes with a lot of challenges that uh, we are trying to work through. So that, I, I can pause here and just see if there are any questions or if we want to hold them off to uh, the end of the entire session, but that's kind of at a uh, very, very, very high level you know, few minute talk on within the defense department, one of the areas that we're using AI ML for, and more specifically AI ML as applied to human physiological monitoring. So with that, I can just pause to take any questions or like I said, just wait to the uh, tail end of this. If there's something quick, we could do it now, um, but otherwise we'll, we'll hold back for the discussion. Thank you. That was a fascinating talk, uh, really highlighting, um, you know, all, all the different um, really extreme exposures that our, our, our servicemen and women um, are exposed to. Um, it sounds like a really exciting and hopefully fruitful area of application for, for AI. Um, yeah, we can discuss it more at the end of the session. Thank our you. Next yeah, thank you so much. Our next speaker is um, Dr. Akane Sano. Um, he's a system professor at Rice University in the Department of Electrical Computer Engineering, Computer Science, and Bioengineering. She directs the Computational Wellbeing Group and is a member of Rice Digital Health Initiative. Her research includes data science, machine learning, and human-centered intelligence systems for health and well-being, and spans the field of, of effective computing, ubiquitous and wearable computing, and biobehavioral sensing and analysis and modeling. She's been developing tools, algorithms, and systems to measure, forecast, understand, and improve health and well-being using multi multimodal data for mobile and wearable de devices in daily life settings and in clinical assessments. Recent awards include the NSF Career Award, the Best IEEE Transactions on Effective Computing in 2021, and the Best Paper Award at IEEE BHI 2019. She received a bachelor's in English and master's in English from Kyo Japan, uh, Kyo University of Japan, and a PhD from MIT here in the United States. Um, welcome, and I'm very excited to hear your talk. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation. And uh, today I'm going to uh, talk about, about uh, research about uh, multimodal machine learning and human-centered computing for health and well-being. And uh, yesterday and today, uh, we have been already uh, discussing a lot on how to integrate like multimodal data uh, from human environment for improving um, or measuring and improving uh, environmental and human health. And today in my talk, I'd like to talk more about how can we design um, this kind of personalized feedback system by combining like three uh, different component, like sensing, like measuring different uh, multimodal data and interpreting uh, what they mean um, by uh, designing some um, new biobehavioral markers, also uh, designing a prediction model, health and well-being prediction models. And we also want to understand ideally what is causing uh, other uh, outcomes. 
And then not only that, we'd like to also connect that to providing feedback, uh, hopefully actionable feedback or intervention, treatment plans, or some information to help uh, this, uh, this make decision making uh, for users, including like patient, people at high, higher risk for health, and uh, et cetera. And so some of our studies are targeting uh, both patient and uh, non-patient population. For example, uh, these uh, studies can be targeted in multiple domains in clinical areas, in uh, like neurology, psychiatry, and oncology. Uh, but also, uh, in addition to patient, uh, we also have been studying uh, the technology, designing technology to support people who are at higher risk for health conditions. For example, this study is uh, we are currently running um, uh, clinical trial to evaluate uh, personalized sleep and well-being assistance for shift workers, uh, including doctor, doctors and nurses. So they wear uh, sensors to measure their physical, physical activity, sleep, and heart rate. And then in this uh, study, we deployed some machine learning to provide um, well-being prediction and also burnout prediction to shift workers. But also, uh, we also have medical doctors in this system who review uh, shift workers' data and provide some suggestions to uh, improve their sleep and health based on cognitive behavioral therapy insomnia. And so we deployed another machine learning uh, models to help these medical doctors to review the data and provide suggestions. So currently we are evaluating effectiveness of this kind of system and how the users, the shift workers, also um, medical doctors uh, use in this kind of system. So when we design this kind of system, we have a lot of challenges to solve in many different uh, stages. For example, in data collection, modeling, uh, how to design feedback, and how to deploy this kind of uh, system models in real life. And today, I want to uh, focus on three topics in my presentation, uh, especially um, so the three topics are, for example, how can we design fair and equitable systems in machine learning models? for diverse group of people. And secondly, I would like to briefly talk about how can we robust and interpretable models with limited data and labels. And lastly, I want to also introduce how can we deploy models uh, developed with multimodal input to the wild with uh, fewer uh, modalities. So uh, the first problem I want to talk about is we want to engage the users and participants in this kind of system uh, while still diversing, um, diversifying data collection. So we want to think about when to sample the data and labels and how can we provide and when we should provide the feedback to users. Then uh, we will be able to use a lot of multimodal data to, for, to predict when is the right moment to sample data and also provide intervention, et cetera. However, the issue with participant and user receptivity is also influenced by their contextual state. So that means if participants or users are experiencing some issues, for example, some health issues, they might not be responding. So that means if we just uh, receive the data, collect data only when they are likely to, to respond, our data might be biased. So potential method is uh, we want to diversify something by taking into account participant context when uh, sending, for example, like surveys, ecological momentary assessment, or interventions. And another issue related to equity is uh, some um, algorithm um, might be making some skewed decisions for some particular group of people. And this bias might be coming from different uh, reasons. For example, in data collection, data labeling, and model training. And but how can we design like generalizable bias mitigation techniques? For example, designing model tuning models or generating data so that our models can work accurately, also equally for a uh, different group of people. For that, uh, we have been uh, testing our framework, uh, like bias mitigation method based on multitask learning and Monte Carlo dropout. I will be uh, briefly talking about this, but the way we do is 
our we designed this kind of neural network model to predict two outcomes, like prediction labels and also protected labels. Uh, this include uh, gender or ethnicity, etc. Then we are manipulating this uh, the weight of a neural network uh, by using a Monte Carlo dropout so that we can control the uncertainty of uh, protected labels. Then we want to uh, um, increase the uncertainty of, uh, uncertainty of protected labels while still preserving the performance of prediction labels so that we can minimize the bias uh, from uh, protected labels on prediction labels. So we evaluated this kind of framework with uh, several different data sets. And so far, our results have been showing that we can uh, improve fairness metrics of uh, our algorithm while still preserving the performance. Uh, so the next problem I want to talk about is limited labels and data. So for example, sensor data can collect large amount of continuous data However, it is very expensive to get um, user uh, input, annotation, or labels. And so that means we have a lot of data um, that are not labeled, unlabeled, and only portion of the data is labeled. So how can we train robust model with smaller amount of labeled data? And we have many um, potential ways to go. And uh, one way we want to think about is how can we leverage unlabeled data to design uh, more robust, also hopefully interpretable models. And so contrastive learning is one technique to train a model using unlabeled data by contrasting samples against each other. And however, in this contrastive learning method, uh, we rely a lot on data augmentation techniques. That means we need to tweak, tweak uh, tune a lot of parameters for data augmentation and techniques to for, uh, learn, for learning uh, robust representation. But so research target is can we learn augmentation policies automatically uh, without tuning manual? Uh, so uh, we introduced this uh, LEAPS lightweight module for training um, uh, data augmentation automatically. So we made this LEAPS module uh, to help us um, automatically learn data augmentation using differentiable data augmentation method, also adversarial training uh, framework. And our experiment showed that leaves can effectively and efficiently select parameters automatically for uh, robust training. And the last thing I want to talk about is how can we integrate multimodal uh, input and for prediction models and systems and deploy that kind of model in uh, real life? Because a lot of applications might want to use multiple sensors as much as possible uh, for better uh, prediction performance, et cetera. However, when we think about deploying that kind of model in the, the real life, we want to reduce the number of sensors because, of, because we want to reduce the, the, the device size, cost, energy consumption, user burden, privacy issues, et cetera. So how can we bring the model designed with a lot of sensors input to, to the application in the wild with fewer uh, input. Uh, for this kind of problem, I, th I think there are many ways to go as well, but uh, one thing we have been trying is designing this kind of framework, uh, we, we call it uh, more to less framework, that allows us to effectively fuse information for, from multiple um, sensors, modality sensors, and also allow us to positively um, transfer the knowledge from strong uh, modality to weak modality, so that uh, when we test our model in um, in the in the wild, and uh, we want to reduce, we can reduce the the modality of, um, input um, sensors, still uh, while preserving the performance. So today uh, I talked about only some of the challenges we have been encountering. However, we also have other challenges to. Uh, overcome uh, when we design this kind of application and systems. And with that, I'd like to uh, thank uh, my team members at Rice University and also collaborators and also funding agencies. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was a fantastic talk. I really appreciate it.
to keep on time, we'll move on to the next speaker. Like I said, hopefully we'll have time for Q&A at the end of the session. I'll ask all the speakers to, um, to stay on um, for, for questions. So our next speaker here is, is Dr. Jen Chen Mai. Um, he's an assistant professor for the Department of Geography at the University of Georgia. Dr. Mai is interested in machine learning, deep learning, geographical information science, geographic question answering, NLP, geographic information retrieval, knowledge graph, and semantic web applications. Currently, his research is focused on geographic question answering and spatially explicit machine learning models. Dr. Mai is also affiliated professor and graduate program faculty of the Department of Computer Science at the University of Georgia and the University of Georgia Institute for Artificial Intelligence and member of um, UGA's Environmental Artificial Intelligence Faculty Cluster, along with the Institute for Integrative Precision Ag Agriculture. He received a PhD in Cartography and Geographic Information Science from the University of California, Santa Barbara, where he's a graduate student researcher at both Space and Time for Knowledge Organization, SDKO Lab at USBC Spatial Center. We're so excited to hear what you've got to share with us today. Thanks for the thanks for the introduction. Um, it's my great pleasure to be here to share uh, our recent work about foundation models for geospatial and health tasks. Um, as a geospatial researcher, so my research will be more from a geospatial artificial intelligence perspective. Um, so my talk will be in three parts. So the first is uh, um, how could we uh, use foundation model in geospatial tasks, and what is the unique challenges and also can we make it in the automatic uh, manner. So recent trend in machine learning and AI speak to the power of uh, uh, scale and generalizability. So instead of uh, developing task specific models, we are interested in developing foundation models, which is just a, a large task agnostic pre-training model, which can be adapted via fine tuning, fusion learning, and zero shot learning on a wide of domains. So good examples is OpenAI GPT-3 and Dell E2. Uh, e so in fact, foundation model has been developed in a lot of domains. So in natural language processing, we have we heard a lot of, uh, about that. So uh, Stanford Alpaca, Alpaca is one of the open source large language models, and ChatGPT and GPT-4 is uh, widely regarded as a uh, state-of-art uh, large language models. In computer visions, um, Google's image gain, um, stable diffusions, and Dell E2 are very important diffusion based vision foundation models. And Meta's uh, segmentation anything models is uh, one of the important segmentation vision foundation models. So, in reinforced learning, deep, uh, deep minds, ghettos is one of the good example. And in uh, signal processing, OpenAI has combined their Vesper and ChatGPT to achieve a lot of signal processing tasks. So um, as a geospatial uh, data science researcher, my question is, uh, can we duplicate or how the existing cutting edge foundation model performed when we compare with the state of art fully supervised task specific models on various geospatial tasks? So uh, in our recent work, we actually test on four different domains like geospatial semantics, urban geography, remote sensing and health geography. So uh, it's very interesting because in our domain we call it health geography, not environment health. Um, so, um, so basically, because of, due to the time limit, uh, we are just discussing two applications, uh, geospatial semantics and health geography. So first, I will discuss about applicability of foundation model on geospatial semantics. So, um, we want to investigate uh, the performance of different large language models on some well-established uh, geospatial semantic tasks, like toponym recognitions, uh, basically recognize large-scale place names, and location uh, description recognition. So basically, we let ChatGPT uh, eight few short examples and let them to generate uh, some tags which we regard as uh, recognized uh, place names from the tags highlighted in the yellow. So in, on the right, it is a similar approach for the location description recognition, but the task is more challenging because it is not aimed at uh, recognizing large scale place names, but recognizing uh, multi-entity fan uh, address from tweet data. Um, so we test on three different uh, well-established uh, data set, and we find out that um, we experiment on uh, different uh, GPT models, including GPT-3, ChatGPT, InstructGPT, and GPT-2 with different various size. 
And in order to um, benchmark it, we compared it with 15 different baselines from, uh, from the literature, especially the state-of-art fully uh, supervised task-specific model, like neural GPR. And we find out like in the first toponym recognition task, um, foundation model uh, like GPT-2 instructed GPT, they can consistently outperform the fully supervised task-specific model with only eight few short examples. Um, and for location description recognition, GPS-3 can achieve the best record score. It seems like it's not related to health, but you will immediately see how it can be worked on the public health research. Um, another application is uh, on one of the health geography tasks. So specifically, we are using a large language model to do time series forecasting on US county level uh, dementia record. So basically, we give um, ChatGPT about uh, the historical uh, dementia record for specific counties and ask them, Can you, could, could you predict me uh, what will be the dementia record for next year? And we find out without any training data or without any specific training, the chat GPT is able to outperform, like especially uh, instructed GPT and GPT-3 can outperform the fully supervised uh, ARIMA models without any training data. So this is the visualization for the map where uh, this is the prediction errors. The blue indicate uh, underestimation, where the red indicate overestimation. You can see different GP2 models uh, significant underestimate the dementia record, where the GPT, uh, the instructed GPT and GP3 provide a more balanced, uh, reasonable predictions. So next, I will discuss about some unique challenges for foundation model to apply this to this kind of task. So one of the shortcomings is uh, this kind of uh, foundation model by design, they are unable to handle geographic coordinate. So for example, if you ask uh, ChatGPT not only recognize the place name, but please predict the geographic coordinate, even if they can recognize the place name very well, uh, the, their prediction for coordinate is hundreds of miles away from the ground truth you can see from the map. Um, why is that? Because by design, they are unable to handle geospatial vector data like point, polylines, and polygons. And uh, they cannot perform implicit spatial reasoning in a way that is grounded in the real world. Um, another uniqueness is many data modalities using geospatial data. And uh, now we see a lot of uh, uh, environmental health researchers using geospatial data. But geospatial data itself is also multimodal. Like we have geospatial vector data, remote sensing images, spirit view images, we have geotax data, we have geographic knowledge graph. So uh, this really calls for a multimodal approach. So in our recent vision paper, we propose like, uh, we need to develop a multimodal foundation model for GOA that use their geospatial relations as alignment among different data modalities. So the advantage is that uh, uh, we can do knowledge transfer across different data modalities. So how to achieve that? So to tackle the first goal, so because of, to make the model geo-aware, aware their geographic locations, so we, um, we have developed a series of tools we call it spatial representation learning. So the idea is uh, we want to represent uh, spatial data like point, polylines, and polygons into the embedding space so that it can be used in deep neural network. Another challenge, is, as I said, is multimodal, uh, 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 multimodal training. So we take the first step to propose a multimodal pre-training objective specific for geospatial tasks. So we call it a contrasted spatial pre-training. So basic idea is uh, we contrast the representation between a geographic locations with the visual representation, or it can be language representations in a self-supervising manner. So the advantage is uh, obvious. So we can do knowledge transfer across different data modalities to, uh, and to uh, make the model geographic aware. So Lastly, I want to talk about uh, our most recent work about uh, how to uh, make uh, large language models in an autonomous manner to achieve a health, public health task like Alzheimer's disease in epidemiologists. So basically, we call it AD Auto GPT. So basically, it is a GPT-4 based AI assistant model which can conduct data collections, data processing, data analysis about complex health and narratives of Alzheimer's disease in a fully automatic miners where uh, users uh, tactile input. So you can see this is a uh, over like a very high level overview for what a model looks like. So basically 
you can just uh, tell them what is the final goal. So could you help me to know something about something new about Alzheimer's disease and maybe draw some plot for them? So in order to do that, the GPT-4 will first uh, interpret this goal and divide the final goal into several smaller tasks. And then he will identify the useful tools from the instruction libraries and solve each of the smaller tasks. And then it will form a data processing pipeline for them. And all of this process is uh, conducted automatically by uh, foundation models. So this is some result. So basically, the ADL GP is able to automatically first search Alzheimer's disease related news from Google, and then it can save the news articles in the disk. And then it can extract the spatial temporal information, like doing the top number recognitions, as we said before, and it's fourth, doing some topic modelings on top of this news, and fifth, to visualize some result. So here you can see the figure A is um, the spatial distribution of all the extracted places mentioned in this Alzheimer's disease news for the past one years. The figure B is the news count per month for the past one years about Alzheimer's. C is the LDA topic modeling about all news, uh, all news articles. And D is a, a stream graph to show the uh, topic trend uh, for, the, for the past one years. So uh, that's all I want to say. We are also organizing a, a special issue on geospatial foundation models uh, on our uh, flagship journals in uh, GI science. And um, that is uh, all the uh, papers I based uh, uh, I use in my presentations. And uh, thank you for listening. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. I, I really learned a lot um, in this talk about about new um, areas for um, GPT to expand. Um, we've got one final speaker um, in this session, um, so we'll we'll move on um, to Dr. Nic Nicholas Scaff. Um, he's an environmental public health fellow at the center at the CDC and working with the environmental public health tracking program. He applies principles of ecology, epidemiology, and data science to assess spatial and temporal patterns in human health issues arising from environmental factors. He's particularly passionate about developing machine learning models that can identify and forecast important health crises and creating compelling data visualizations to communicate findings that support public health actions. Nick is also interested in research that broadly addresses urgent environmental concerns and collaborates with the FW Data Intensive Landscape Limnology Lab and the Global Lakes Eco Ecological Observatory Network to better understand anthropogenic threats to, what, to freshwaters at national and global scales. Nick received his PhD from the Department of Fisheries and Wildlife at Michigan State University. His dissertation research assessed the combined effects of extreme climate events and land cover on mosquito-borne disease transmission. Later as a postdoc at the School of Public Health at UC Berkeley, he applied machine learning methods to understand the environmental drivers of West Nile virus transmission in California. Welcome, um, and I'm very excited to hear more about what you've got to share. We can see your slide, but I can't hear you. Is that working better? Now we can hear you. Okay, awesome. Give me one second. Of course. All right, thank you so much for having me here today. Um, I'm gonna be giving you a brief introduction to um, the Environmental Public Health Tracking Program, which is situated within the National Center of Environmental Health at CDC. Um, I'm hoping that, and this overview of our program can seed some ideas about different AI applications, since we don't do a whole lot actively in that space right now, but it might be a, uh, a potential area of growth for us in the future. So at Tracking, our main aim is to connect environmental information and related health information in kind of a one-stop shop. Um, we make this data accessible to anyone, and uh, we make it very easy to visualize and share and download. Uh, this slide gives an overview of uh, some of our data offerings. So if you start on the left-hand side of the slide, um, we, we address a variety of environmental hazards, uh, including air quality, extreme heat, drinking water quality, drought, uh, among many others. We also look at uh, human exposures, for example, pesticide exposures. Um, a key area for us is 
also health effects of different environmental exposures and hazards. Um, so these can include asthma, cancer, heart disease, heat related illnesses, childhood lead poisoning, and many others. And finally, we, we like to think about um, the characteristics of populations. So um, what are the socioeconomic and demographic characteristics of different locations? What kinds of vulnerabilities do these populations have? And even things like uh, the design of different communities, like access to parks or proximity to highways, um, that kind of thing. We collect these different kinds of data, both as a standalone program at CDC and also by funding 33 recipients, mostly state health departments, but also um, local health departments uh, through a cooperative agreement um, that, that asks these different jurisdictions to build and maintain their own tracking programs and environmental data networks. Uh, the goal of all of this is to uh, grow public health capacity in these jurisdictions, uh, also to build expertise in environmental health surveillance, and uh, implicitly it's to, to modernize data systems in these jur jurisdictions. To kind of collect and maintain standardized data from these very disparate uh, locations, these are, are different tracking funding recipients, we've created something called NCDMs or Nationally Consistent Data and Measures. These NCDMs help to ensure that the data our recipients release on their own and the data that they share with us is consistent across all the different jurisdictions and can be harmonized with existing data on the CDC tracking network. Um, some examples of data that our recipients uh, produce, share, and, and provide to us include data on hospitalizations, um, including things like hospitalizations for asthma or COPD, uh, emergency department visits, birth defects, uh, reports of birth defects, uh, community drinking water quality measurements, um, radon testing, uh, among others. So we have a lot of data, um, but our goals extend uh, a lot further beyond just having data. Um, we, we work really hard to deliver the data in ways um, that address the needs of different stakeholders uh, and also to inform decision-making at local, state, and national levels. Our flagship product is the Interactive Data Explorer. Uh, at this point, it has over 700 different uh, environmental and health data measures. It has a variety of data vis visualizations, including uh, chloroplough maps uh, that you can overlay with other maps and, and show side by side with, with uh, gridded data products. Um, we have also have charts and tables that, that can be visualized using this platform. Uh, the platform also allows you to download the data for further analysis or export maps. And an exciting new feature we have is the ability to embed, produce HTML code that allows you to embed any map chart or table into your own website uh, using very, very simple code. We also have different dashboards, which focus on specific topic areas. For example, one that we have focuses on environmental justice. These dashboards are a bit different from the interactive data explorer in that they focus on a specific topic and um, they provide additional context that we can't show in the data explorer, such as text and infographics that help with data literacy regarding the dashboard and, and just generally provide better understanding of, of all the data. And finally, all of our data can be accessed using an API that, that we produce um, that, that's publicly accessible. Um, so the data are very easy to access by uh, developers if they're creating their own apps or websites, um, but also epidemiologists or other stakeholders that might want raw data rather than uh, you know, a, a map that's already been produced. I wanna to provide, to, to kind of wrap this up, I wanna provide some additional details about our API because I think um, that would be really relevant to any AI applications that, that might emerge from our data. So just a bit of an overview, tracking data is organized in a tiered system where we have measures that represent the actual data. We have indicators that house different suites of measures um, that address a similar topic. And finally, we have broad categories of indicators that are grouped together in something called a content area. 
Um, the, the API responds to several key functions that both describe the data uh, available and allow the user to uh, understand what data is out there and to download it. Um, for example, we have functions that return lists of available items in uh, uh, that are content areas, indicators, and measures. So which content areas are available, indicators, and measures that are available. Um, we have functions that return lists of available geographic boundaries and temporal aggregations. So uh, you can query to figure out if a uh, data product is available at the county level, the tract level, state, or if it's available daily, monthly, annually, um, that kind of thing. Uh, also, you can use functions to return lists of the different places where data is available. So um, you can ask whether data is available in a particular county, uh, like Fulton County, Georgia, or during a particular year, like is, is this data available in 2020? And finally, the keystone function that actually retrieves the data um, is called get, uh, get full core holder, and it can take all the information that's queried from the above functions um, to retrieve data of interest. So we can say we want data from a particular content area uh, in the year 2020 and, and pull that data down. And then finally, um, we have a software package for the R programming language um, called EPH Tracker that serves as a wrapper for the API. This makes API calls trivially easy for our users um, and facilitates a bunch of um, additional applications like statistics, mapping, for example, um, creating dashboards like shiny, our shiny dashboards, and many, many, many other applications that you might want to, you might be able to access using the R language. Um, so I hope the API and maybe the package can be a springboard for a variety of different AI applications for our data. Um, yeah, and with that, I'll conclude. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was great. We've got a few minutes now um, before um, sort of turning it over to, to the, the closing session here um, to take questions and have discussions. So I'd invite um, our speakers to please put your cameras um, back on, be ready for questions. Um, and if our speaker in the room um, could also come near a mic, um, we'll open we'll open the floor to questions about anybody's um, discussion here. I can say one thing I really enjoyed about this session was really seeing at a very practical level what is what are some great translational uses of, of AI. You each presented some really important um, use cases and left me very optimistic with how close um, some of that, that technology is, um, is to actually um, helping. Um, so I think that's a great way to end this sort of session with something sort of practical and optimistic. Hi, uh, this is Megan uh, Wild Latshaw in the room, and um, uh, thank you all for great talks. Uh, Nicholas, good to see you. I was wondering if, you know, one of the things that I've heard uh, about tracking is, you know, it's often delayed, you know, and oh, great, it would be awesome to have real time data. I'm wondering if AI might be able to help in that space. Do you have any thoughts about that? Um, or is that something you really haven't thought much about? Um, it, it absolutely is. We are moving in that direction uh, in terms of bringing in not necessarily real-time data, but definitely low latency data in collaboration with some of our partners at NASA, NOAA, and EPA, where we um, tap into gridded data coming from satellites or reanalysis products, um, process, that, process that in some of our newer um, cloud-based uh, data systems, and present that in our interactive uh, mapping portal and, and that kind of thing. Um, we haven't done anything that specifically uh, incorporates AI. Um, we have we have a kind of a tangential familiarity with some of the other products that were mentioned in this session, like Tower Scout. Um, but at this point, we, we haven't used um, that product or any other AI products. But I think we're open to that. Um, it's just about having the capacity and the funding and uh, our leadership emphasizing that that should be a priority area, um, which might might be coming in the future. Thanks.
since it's quiet, um, <laughs> I'll follow up and just say, you know, I think um, it, you know, the real time data to me would be, a mo or at least low latency data would be most interesting with the idea of prevention, you know, identifying, you know, again, using AI to maybe identify worrisome trends um, so that there might be an opportunity to intervene. And I, I'll come back yesterday, I mentioned Flint, Michigan, and if we had, you know, maybe some data that was, a, we didn't have to wait till a pediatrician noticed these high blood lead levels, maybe um, AI could have done that for us and we could have intervened sooner. If it's a little quiet, and don't forget, you can put your um, questions or comments in the chat as well. Um, and a little space, I'll uh, take advantage of my moderator um, role to ask a few more questions. Um, across the areas that you guys talked about, really what are top research priorities? Like what do you see in, in your areas that are the current limitations and gaps? And, and what, are, what are those top priorities that, that you think are, are needed um, to move the work forward? And I'll ask that to all of you. I, this is Warren Henkla from the JPEO with the, the wearables talk. I, in my mind, one of the, the top research priorities for us is sort of an enterprise level roll up monitoring. Um, so I know th there was a, a mention of using AI just to be able to try to collect the insight at the individual level. Um, again, as I mentioned during our talk, we, we do have challenges of moving that data. That's not necessarily a, a, a research kind of um, problem. That's something that's just affects the DOD. But once we do get that data moved into a centralized location, being able to pick out sort of the needle in the haystack type thing, like being able to monitor and predict when someone's getting sick before they actually show symptoms, you can roll that up at a large population enterprise level that's a huge, powerful tool to be able to identify a pandemic or some other, you know, bio threat that's being um, kind of wrecking havoc in the area, and you can do that sooner. So, for from my perspective, one of the areas that we are lacking is sort of that enterprise level analysis of just teasing out um, when are we actually entering a pandemic? When is this just a normal run of the mill flu outbreak? Something to pay attention to, but not pandemic mode, everyone, you know, decon your groceries. When do we need to flip that switch? That's a very difficult thing. And I know there is research ongoing there, but uh, I, I, I would be very interested in anyone that has any insight or ideas on using that, but with wearable data, with, you know, collecting heart rate physiological data, um, just to try to be able to know when do we flip that switch? Thank you. Shirag, I see you've got your hand up and then we've got a, a, a question in the chat too. But if you'll... Fantastic. Yes. Yeah, so thanks for letting me ask the question on uh, the, uh, the great talk that you gave, Dr. Mine. I think this is applicable to all. Um, when you talk about foundation models, particularly in sort of this uh, dynamic environment in which you are processing these data, how are you thinking about updating this information uh, such that it, it, you know, it, it is timely for uh, tasks that you know that we cannot anticipate. Um, can you speak to speak to that? That's an excellent question. Actually, I want to I actually want to share my thought on that. We recently think about like what the unique challenges in geography and uh, health in terms of using the foundation model. If you try to use GPT four or ChatGPT, and sometimes we will ask you uh, if we told you that. Uh, Sorry, our model is trained upon the information between 2022 20, September, and all the information in the future we cannot capture that. But if you think about like how much like money or resources you need to retrain this kind of model, it's huge. So and it's also considered not only an impact. It's not it's not like like you have economic impact, but it also have environmental impact. Consider like the um like um carbon consumptions, and uh, we recently have a paper on that. But uh, if you specifically think about the geography and, and health issues, we consider uh, how many new data sets, like satellite data or like stream data. You collect millions of them every day. So 
basically, uh, and also in health, you have uh, new tracking data every day. So basically, you need to refresh the foundation model every day to make sure you keep up to space, right? <laughs> so which is, uh, um, if you think about the cost, uh, it is uh, un unbelievable. So in our paper, we discuss about uh, like uh, this is not this should not be uh, the correct way to just train a model and refresh it and refresh it <laughs> again and again. We need a new approach, for example, to a cheaper way to do that. And also, as we said in the previous uh, sessions, we need to estimate the, uh, the environmental impact of all these large language models. Um, so some of the, for example, some of the companies or countries who use this uh, um, model a lot, but they necessarily they didn't pay the environmental cost because they are trained on other countries, but where the other countries don't use, we should also raise an environmental justice issue. Yeah. Rima, is your question a follow-up or, or a different topic? See your hand up. Oh, thank you. Um, sorry, Allison. It's somewhat of a follow-up, if you don't mind. Thank yep, you. go for it. Then we'll then we'll go to the the questions in the chat. So it's also for Dr. May. I very much enjoyed your talk. Thank you. I wonder also if you can talk to us a little bit. So I know in health geography, let's say, you know, we're looking at trends across geography, right, and across these different aggregate boundaries in space. Do you see any challenges, or what do you think we still need to work on? to be able to use these amazing models that you talked about to go to, let's say, individual level health risk prediction. Do you feel like we're there or do we need kind of more work to get there? Thank you. Thank you. Um, that's an ex excellent question. So um, in our, so I actually uh, want to ask this question, um, question myself a lot. In geography, we have a well-known well problem called the magnified union area problem, MAUP which is just means like you will get different results when you statistic, uh, you analysis in different uh, level, for example, zip code level, county level, state level. Maybe sometimes you analyze individual level, uh, you are not getting a slightly different result. Maybe the hypothesis will be proved or reject just uh, simply based on how you partition the space. So um, this is really a challenge when we um, meet, uh, when we meet this issue, first of all, um, there are several challenges. First, because of the privacy issue, um, considering how the, now the foundation model is uh, open access to all of us. So um, we actually see some paper to see we can actually hack using some specific prompt to hack the foundation model to actually extract some sensible, uh, sensitive information from the user, like the health record or, um, but how, how do we deal with that? Uh, for example, OpenAI, I think they are collaborating with some medical companies to build a, like a private foundation model for, for a specific purpose. Um, this is a, some privacy issue. Another issue, like I mentioned before, um, because different spatial uh, partition will give different results, it's basically um, also related to uh, the hip spatial heterogeneity of all the um, uh, phenomena we have seen, for example, in different countries, in different states. So however, um, all the AI models we have seen is just universal model. We just apply it everywhere. For example, if you train a model in US, for example, ChatGPT can do uh, can do a lot of amazing things. But uh, if you migrate into Africa or migrate to another country who have limited data, it is very difficult to do that. So um, we are also working on. Uh, I think there is another uh, a speaker in our uh, GeoAI workshop in last week talking about uh, spatial heterogeneities. Um, I think this is a pricing issue, especially we call it a fairness uh, across the space. Yeah, this is, I think, the two most important thing. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll share two of the questions um, sent to me through chat. Um, in AI regulation, there appears to be little mention of how humans might interact incorrectly with AI outputs, um, as in the uncertainty in the AI-derived prediction. What might regulation in the framework of human AI communication look like? It's a big question. Yeah, I think that's a very good question. So I think always like we want to make sure that what is the like, uncertainty or certainty, the confidence level of the output. And because of course the model won't be able to, um, you know, 
uh, behaving perfectly, then um, so we want to make sure that you know when we want to also carefully evaluate when the model uh, makes error and why, and then always try to uh, like output not not only just um, like ninety percent performance or some outcomes, but how uh, confident uh, they are. Thank you. As a follow up, we've got as AI derived predictions into the forecasting mainstream, how can the potential for model hallucination um, create a parallel misinformation pandemic? For example, augmenting downstream models with predictions data from AI models upstream. Yeah, I think this is also a great question. So I also talked about data augmentation in my uh, talk, but that means uh, we might be able to just uh, augment the data themselves and can just generate completely fake data. Then how should we uh, stop doing that kind of things? Then uh, if we we might want to make another model to verify that the data streams are uh, real or fake or integrating that kind of uh, verification into the system. Or, uh, but there might be another model actually uh, developed for even cheating or uh, checking that kind of uh, fake uh, true uh, checking models as well. Thanks. We've got one more question um, in on the chats. Um, how shall AI establish linkages for preventive measures when health data and environmental data are in different time scales? Health data of healthy people are discrete and environmental data are continuous. So I think a, a general question on, on you guys' thoughts on how we're going to deal with the, the heterogeneity um, of the different data types, both in scale and format. Um, I can talk about that. Um... I think I really like the answer from the previous session from uh, uh, Dr. Joe about uh, using a knowledge graph to, for the solutions because the knowledge graph is uh, supposed to be the design solution to integrate data from heterogeneous source, uh, from health, from environment, uh, from other resources. We actually uh, develop a knowledge graph called Nowhere Graph who aim at uh, integrate data from cross domains. But uh, we realize there is uh, still a lot of challenges like uh, uh, data availability uh, and some data format issue, uh, and uh, um, yeah, but I think the uh, uh, this is uh, one of the way I think is more promising. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so we're at the end of our time um, for discussion. I appreciate again. Um, really enjoyed everyone's talks. I um, appreciate hearing your your thoughts and input um, in this discussion. And I know we've got just a minute um, before we switch over to give Carmen time um, to to so give closing remarks. Thank you all. Big round of applause, everybody. Thanks so much. That was a fantastic session. So thank you very much to those speakers and, and to Allison for pulling that together. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for joining us for these two days of thought provoking and energizing presentations on the potential for AI and environmental health. We start today with a broad overview of issues regarding governance of AI, data, and the needed infrastructure to make some of these opportunities that we've heard about work. Dr. Gergurk started the session by providing examples of the power of AI, particularly highlighting AlphaFold, which can now accurately predict the structure of a protein just by inputting a DNA sequence. She highlighted that NIH, in collaboration with corporate partners, has made over 200 petabytes of data available, although this data may not be in the appropriate form to utilize in AI tools. This brings up the importance of the development of common data elements. And she noted that the NIH Office of Data Sciences is working across institutes to assure that data being generated by researchers they support is findable, shareable, and AI ready. She also highlighted the Aim Ahead program, which has a goal to enhance the participa participation and representation of researchers and communities currently underrepresented in the development of AI, improving capabilities, and addressing health disparities. Dr. Calzada from the CDC's Office of Public Health Data, Surveillance, and Technology is bringing his experience as a technology leader to public health. He described the development of an improved public health data strategy at CDC, bringing together public health functions and data technology to improve public health responses. He noted, noted a big challenge faced by CDC is around the collection, sharing, and use of data, and his hope is that there could be machine-based solutions to address many of these challenges. He provided a number of examples that the CDC is using AI 
tools to improve risk prediction and response. He noted that to continue to build the AI tools at CDC, there needs to uh, be a growth in data science and AI workforce, and to build infrastructure to create scalable solutions that can serve as a resource to state and local partners. Dr. Haven then joined us from Data and Society to talk about governance of AI. She underlined the increased recognition that AI is a democracy issue and that misuse of AI could hold harms and negative consequences to specific individuals and groups of citizens, underscoring the need for good governance of these systems. Currently, the EU is leading on governance with EU AI Act, now in a draft version, that is based around a risk-based framework as a core assessment tool. So they are regulating the use of, te of the technology, not the technology itself, and classify high risk to include harm to people's health and impacts to an individual's rights. In the US, there is a blueprint for AI governance, which is a voluntary guideline for technological protection and privacy. While we have models for regulatory guidelines, we're still strides away from implemented legislation. Dr. Haven emphasized that there's a promise to a future of improved understanding and implementation of, implementation of AI for a greater society and environment, but that the governance designs should be participatory and democratized and not solely led by major corporate players. To end the session, Dr. Suzanne Dorsey discussed the relationship between equity, human health, and environmental health, particularly in the Chesapeake Bay. Highlighting the Chesa Chesapeake Bay Restoration Project, novel technology has been utilized to measure and model environmental inputs and outputs. But now, we can reimagine restoration through AI, examples including real-time environmental modeling, identifying environmental vulnerabilities, managing complex data sources, streamlining communications, and more. In our final session, we highlighted tools and technologies that with AI could advance environmental health and biomedical science. The session started with Mr. Henkla from the US Department of Defense talking about new wearable technologies that are being used to protect US military personnel. These devices are fundamentally changing the tools that are being used, moving from environmental sensors to personalized smartwatches, most of which are focused on physiological monitoring. These monitors collect data and use an algorithm to interpret that data, which is then used to make decisions. Impressively, this has to happen for personnel in a variety of settings and around the world, which poses its own challenges, but also important opportunities to personalize responses. Dr. Sano discussed multimodal machine learning for health and well-being, specifically through personalized healthcare systems that sense, interpret, and provide feedback to improve patient experiences. As an example, she talked about work with shift workers to evaluate their health, provide support, and give feedback to their healthcare providers, all to prevent burnout and improve well-being. She talked about challenges of data collection with higher participant engagement, the need for understanding the participant's context when asking for data and providing interventions, bias in the algorithms and training data, limited labels to data which can impact algorithm training, and bringing multimodal data collection and modeling into real-life settings. She provided ideas for solutions to each of these through a variety of technological and analytical innovations. Dr. Maya, geospatial researcher, talked about the utility of foundation models in geospatial data. He uses these AI tools for a variety of applications, including recognizing specific places of information like place names and descriptors, and for predicting health outcomes. He talked about some of the specific challenges that are faced in geospatial data analysis and work that has been done to address these specific issues. He highlighted the opportunities to use foundation models in a chatbot form to be able to create visualizations of health and disease information, including geographic distributions. Finally, Dr. Scoff talked about the Environmental Public Health Tracking Program at CDC, which is bringing together environmental and health effect data in one place. By providing the data, they are providing opportunities to develop dashboards or visualizations that are relevant to specific needs. The program also provides support <clears throat> for different partners to improve data systems and provides training opportunities so that those partners can improve their high quality consistent data and that they can at, bring that data to their residents and share that standardized data with CDC. They also have resources for statistical packages and interfaces that could help individuals and investigators make use of the wealth of their data. Overall, I think we've seen, building on what Dr. Baccarelli mentioned during his introduction, that you know, over the last two days, we know that not only is AI an incredible opportunity for environmental health, but it's actively being utilized and it holds incredible potential. Of course, the continued expansion of AI in environmental health and biomedical research will not be without challenges and bumps in the road. 
but we are now at a point where we can proactively work to improve data and data standards, develop clear and just governance structures, work towards reducing biases, assure broad and equitable distribution, and train a diverse new workforce in these tools and technologies. I wanna thank you all for taking the time to join us and learn about these innovations and the potential for multimodal AI in environmental health. I wanna take this opportunity to thank all of our speakers over the past two days who really opened our eyes to the potential of AI. Also to the planning committee for this workshop who helped bring all of these great speakers together. Thank you all very much for that. And in addition, we have been supported by a great group of staff from the National Academies of Science, including Lily Luhachak, O'Shane Orr, Natalie Armstrong, Jessica Demoy, and Elizabeth Boyle. Thank you for providing the support needed. This has been great. And I think now we just wanna tell you a little bit about the, the uh, breakout sessions that's gonna be happening next. So um, can we bring up that slide on the breakout sessions? Great. So um, we hope you will join us uh, for these breakout sessions um, in informal networking and make use of the links that you've been sent. So if you're online, you've been sent some links to your email um, to be able to join into those sessions. The goals for the breakout session is to provide an opportunity for participants to engage and exchange ideas, have a forward-looking discussion based on what we heard and learned about during the workshop, and discuss actionable steps that can be taken that will move the needle. For those breakout groups, we do have some instructions on how to structure the discussions. Um, we'd ask that you introduce yourself, your institution or who you might represent or where you're from, um, and your area of expertise. And then if you had any terms or concepts that have come up in the past two days that were unfamiliar to you and maybe are still unfamiliar or you don't totally understand, um, please talk about those. And I think there could be an opportunity for someone in that breakout group who might understand it better to be able to help address that that misunderstanding. So I think this is a great time to learn even more. Um, and then we have a few prompts about questions that we'd like to have discussed in each of the groups. And each of the groups will uh, be assigned a theme around which they can discuss some of these. But thinking again about challenges and barriers and how they can be overcome, what steps should be taken, are there tools to better integrate AI and EH and biomedical research? Um, what are some of the big key concepts and technologies you thought really will advance the field that you may have heard about in the past two days? Um, and what could be some of the next exciting advances? And so we hope you take some time to, to join us in these breakouts. We think this is a great opportunity to be able to, to keep moving this discussion forward. Again, thank you all for joining us and have a great rest of your week.